Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series that takes you deep into the fascinating world of microbes. My name is Aga Pokrywka and I invite you to join us in a conversation with people from the most diverse backgrounds, including science, gastronomy and arts, to develop new recipes for living on a broken planet. You enter a restaurant in a historical Art Nouveau building, right in the center of Helsinki, Finland. You sit down and a person wearing a stylish uniform made of discarded textiles pours water into a glass that is made out of a used bottle. You look around and wait for your food. There is not a single trash bin. Instead, there is a stainless steel sci-fi looking piece of furniture which turns out to be a composter nicknamed Lauri. Finally, your dish comes on a plate made of waste clay. It looks and it tastes delicious. Your food is waste-free too. Welcome to Nola, the first zero-waste restaurant in the Nordic countries. In this episode, we chat with one of its founders, Albert Frank Sunier, about establishing and running a zero-waste restaurant with a little help from microbes, of course. When I said welcome, I meant it literally. This conversation was recorded in a hustle and bustle of the restaurant. So have a seat at our table and let's enjoy a brand new episode of Ferment Radio. I think the idea of zero waste of Nola was born as to to open a restaurant that at the end of the day, nothing that came in would live without a value. Uh, so basically not to create garbage of anything. Uh, I think this have been changing a lot through the years because we understood that it's maybe not so linear in a sense that if you get a carrot in and that was maybe like the more more naive thought when we opened it's not only about what i do with the leaf what i do with the top what i do with the bottom what i do with the skins what i do with the flesh but it's more where this carrot comes from, how it has been grown, where it's the energy that has been going there, uh, how many people has been there, is these people being paid fairly, it's uh, how it's transported to the restaurant, does this carrot have been brought in packaging, uh, how this carrot is going to be consumed, how much it takes to process this carrot to be consumed, uh, what's going to happen with the part of the carrots that are not consumed, how I can solve this part, and if something ends up that it's not usable, how I'm going to process this, that I still does have a life after that. Um, so yeah, this like very naive of like, come in, goes out with value. I think it became way more like a, a spider web <laughs> complexity of like how you put together like all these um, more like a waste that you can touch and you can sense but as well like all these i like to call them like the invisibles like the invisible waste of uh, energy consumption water consumption transportation etc that sometimes are a little bit are a little bit uh, mm -hmm, forgotten mm -hmm. and from your experience where in the restaurant context yeah. where the most waste comes from I in like a conventional restaurant um if we talk about volume I would say packaging. Uh, I mean, it's it's crazy like to see these uh, little rooms with like uh, plastic containers, carton containers, and just people like trying to smash things out, like pushing with the fists and like the leg just to make sure that there is more space. If we think probably the ones that has more relevance when you talk about waste, probably food is the biggest one. Then, but it's more like scraps or what people leave on the plates or both? No, I think I think it's it's as well like a very like unthought parts of ingredients that classically restaurant industry thinks about them as a as a non how to say it, novel parts like parts that they are going to be thrown away that they are like a resourceless 
and we just don't put much thought on like how to use them. I think there is a lot of that. Obviously, there is a lot of food that probably like people leave on the plates, but I think it's more on the early stage before it reaches the plate to the plate where there is most of the waste created. Well, coming from all this reflection on zero waste and running a zero waste restaurant, I, I can imagine it's a long path. And I wonder, could you spot like some breaking point on this path to open actually the restaurant? It's a big commitment in a way yeah. to the concept. I, I will start with the most positive one. And the most positive is that six years after running a zero waste restaurant, I don't remember that our restaurant is a zero waste restaurant. Meaning that all be everything becomes a habit and you get humans, we get used to everything very quick. So now if I would open a restaurant that work in a way that I've been working before, I should call it that I open a non-zero waste restaurant because the normality for me had become to work in a zero waste restaurant. And I think that's the greatness of of being running NOLA for six years, like this, how normal it is. And it doesn't take six years, it takes like way, way shorter. I mean, people come in to work on the first two months, you see them struggling, what I'm gonna do with it stays in my hand, uh, it's burning, how I'm gonna solve it. Um, in half a year, they don't remember anymore, like what is a clean film, vacuum bag, or, or why we are not using it, like all these parts that now we are using. The the hardest part when we started six and a half years ago, seven years ago, if we count the pop-ups, it was how to make people understand who we were, what zero waste meant, and not to have like misconceptions about zero waste in a sense that for a while we were, oh, these three guys that open a restaurant that they pick expire products from containers of restaurants or, the guys that cook with trash. When we couldn't be further than that, I mean, we believe that that it's a, it's it's not solving, it's prevention, what we are doing. Uh, and I think this is as well like a very, very important uh, part of it. This was a very tough one when we opened, make people to understand, and, and make people to understand that it's not only about food. We found at the beginning when we started, we made some research that Zero Waste Restaurant, like, 99.9 percent were just focused on food where and i remember one of us going to eat in a zero world restaurant and getting uh single use plates and uh, single use plastic cutlery and we were like "Fuck, what are we talking about so like i think this yeah this this misconception on like how wide had become like the concept on on at some point meaning so many different for like so many different was was very hard at the beginning um, creating the systems of, of how we work that was that was tricky because the three of us we come from a very different backgrounds mm, I mean when we opened six and a half maybe now it's a bit more common but like I mean we're talking seven years ago like we couldn't find I mean we happily met Doug and, and from from Silo and all the work that he's been doing on on zero waste and that was the only uh, how to say place where we could kind of like find reference of, of like how maybe a zero waste restaurant works or looks. So it has been a lot of like a trial error. I hit my head in the wall. Oof, that's hurt. Let's not hit it again. Um, so creating the system was hard. And then um, ingredients in that was as well, like a very challenging at the beginning. Not when you, not, not on the ingredients that we were working with the small producers. That That's, that's fairly easy. You, you get them to understand the concept and they, they are like extremely happy to 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 work with you, uh, probably because we are like kind of how to say like more aligned on the on the on the thoughts or the way that we, we like to run our businesses. But uh, when you start like a scaling up on uh, oil production, salt production, vinegar production, all these kind of things that a factory to say it, it's involved. That was very tricky. I mean, uh, it, it took us a while to find a way of like how to make it um, waste less uh, to receive like all, all these ingredients. But I think, yeah, probably like like the understanding 
the systematizing and the sourcing were probably like the, the three the three biggest um yeah hard points hot pots however we want to call it when we started when we opened nola definitely so nola is now six years five years nola is gonna be now six and a half years okay but 2023 was the first year that we had the full year of operation so we opened eight months we closed eight months because this is what i was yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. that nola was relatively young when yeah. the covid came so it's also like a big success that you made it through because since you do the zero concept yeah. like uh, you cannot really take yeah. it away so easily, right? Yeah. I really wanted to ask you a question where you kind of uh, give us a visualized tour through the restaurant. Yeah, no, let's divide it uh, in, I would say like in, in four different pieces. Like we have the main dining room uh, where we have around like 35 to 40 seats. Um, this is maybe like the easiest space, like the, the middle space that is the entrance until now had been holding a brewery that sadly we let go one week ago, uh, but go to really good hands with the guys that opened the brewery in, in Hamelina, a little bit like north from Helsinki. It's It, it had a little bit more like the feel of like this, this bar kind of like area where you come in, you can sit, more like interacting with like the, the waiters and as well like few tables and we want to keep this feel even though the brewery is out we are bringing like a big desk that it will sit like between 12 and 15 people i think as well it plays a big role that i'm from barcelona my one of my partners is portuguese and the other is, is serbian and probably we grew up sitting in bar desks and this is kind of some some feeling that we wanted to bring sure. when probably here in the north at least in Finland like it's not per se that common uh yeah and we we rebuild the, the desk a little bit like different making it like uh more dynamic with more like entries and exits so there is a lot going on then there is a, a little we call it wine room that is gonna be now like a little room with like one big table for like 10 to 16 people uh, for groups or families or friends or whoever wants to come and enjoy there like with a little bit more privacy and then there is the kitchen uh, that the kitchen will be all reorganized when we open second nola our budgets were still very 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 low and even has been the talk now of like how bad restaurant industry is doing and like the struggles and everything. We don't want to do this renovation to try to survive. We want to do it to just become better. And I think this is very important. The little money that we gather is kind of like reinvested to become better that, that we've been like now. We will finally be able to choose materials that make more sense to our concept than the ones that they were there. We can organize the restaurant as, as we want uh, to make as well things easier to our staff when it comes like to cleaning, to serving, to everything, uh, to cooking. And I think the last thing that it's missing here of if you come into the kitchen to Nola, on the left side of the kitchen, a week ago, you could find like all the big tanks where beer was born. And now it's going to be an area for guests with like a table from like eight to 10 guests that they can be actually having dinner inside of the kitchen while see how the operation works. Ah, that's very interesting. Yes, I think it's, I think it's very, or has been very important for us from the beginning that as a, as a zero waste restaurant, the part of our work is transparency. So it wouldn't make any sense to have things to hide when I think what we are doing, it's more like to create some kind of system practices that everyone can come and learn and take with them and we're happy to explain so we thought that maybe it would be interesting as well to put it out for the customers that they can see that what, what we do is nothing weird you know sometimes we we got these comments of like but you have a compost on the restaurant where i'll get will i get sick when i'm coming to it and it's like fuck, fuck no like it's far from that um so i think to open making the restaurant as visible as possible to people to come to it i hope it helps to increase this like a sense of like normalization that the practices that we do is something actually extremely normal and it should be in our opinion the norm 
but everything it can be can be able to see. So that's a little bit like how how Nola looks. Um, beautiful uh, building from the 1900s. Beautiful big windows that you feel almost you are sitting on the street. Beautiful tiling, original tiling on the floor, brown and beige, giving kind of like this feeling of the south almost that we were very happy with. Uh, dark tables, like uh, uh, beautiful, like kind of like organic shapes. Um, but as well, not wanting to make things to look too serious in a sense uh, that uh, we don't want people to feel <laughs> kind of like a scare when they come in. You know, it's a place for everyone. It's a place that everyone, in our opinion, can uh, can come in and enjoy. Either you are one person, 10 people, a family, some friends, a business, you come with a dog, you come with uh, kids, whatever, it doesn't matter. Everyone, uh, it's it's welcome and happy to enjoy. So just like to bring kind of like this this feel to everyone through through the space as well that we believe. It's, and it's did the composter? Cool. Composter sits in the dining room. We find it like a, it's, it's a very big tool of normalization. I, I use a lot the, the word of normalization because I think uh, I will not use sustainability because I think it's it's so damaged the word that I don't want to use it anymore. But like a like a zero waste restaurants or responsible restaurants are are still not the norm. It's something is still really like eccentric, sadly. Uh, so one of the big fights that we took is like to normalize who who we are and how we work, hoping that by normalizing people jumps in and hopefully follows at least some of the practices that we have to offer that we've been like, kind of like putting in place for the last six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the composter being sitting on the dining room is kind of like, here we are, this is who we are. Uh, you can see it and uh, what we do is nothing strange. Yeah. It's so little strange that you actually can sit next to one hour, like, like one of our like more important practice that we that we have and still have lunch or dinner next week dinner lunch no we don't open for lunches dinner next week without nothing strange happening yeah. and and we hope that it sparks conversation and we hope that yeah it, it just brings this feel of like we to the customers we're not so sure what's actually happening here but we can sense that it's not 100 percent normal do you get a lot of questions from the customers about the concept itself yes, or people get, don't care yes. so much we get uh, we get some yeah definitely like some questions but you can realize through the years that there is a lot of people coming in that actually they have no idea what we are doing and that's awesome mm -hmm. uh, People has been sometimes complaining, bit saying, uh, complaining in a very, uh, in a very like a light way that we don't explain much, too much, we don't explain enough what we do, and we actually thought it because it's part of the normalization. Like when you come to a restaurant, I think restaurant uh, sometimes should be, or most of the time, should be under the experience of who are you sitting, uh, how are you feeling. Um, like we are there, I think, to, to provide a service that helps to have a great time, uh, not to be the main character of the evening of someone. This happens as well, but I don't think it's like the more common kind of like a thread when, when people goes out to, to it. So we felt at some point that maybe it would be counterproductive to go to the table and be, hello, welcome to Nola Zero Waste Restaurant. Here is like a Zero Waste Circus, as I explained to you, exactly everything what we are doing. And but it's not maybe first. about the words, but it's about experience, right? Yes, exactly. And that's what, that's the, that's the example of the, of the, of the composter. Or when you drink water, your glass is a whole bottle that now it become a glass. And when you take your napkin, you see that the napkin has a different feel and it's because it's like ends of fabrics of, of, and when you see our, the way that we are dressed, we are dressed using like a, like shirts that are made with like all linens and your cutlery, when, if you are from Finland, you realize it's like a very old cutlery that we've been picking and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we hint you through the menu 
that if you want to catch it and you want to ask, it's very easy for you to go there. But if you feel that this evening, maybe my priority is something else that is catching up with someone I haven't seen for a while or just having a good time with my friends or whatever, we are not going to come there to bomb you either. Because when you go to a normal as a very uh, old way of seeing like a normal restaurant, you normally don't get like, oh, your glasses are coming from this company. I know your wine glasses are coming from, or your napkins or your calories. So if we wanted to become normal and normalize what we do, we felt that maybe that wouldn't help on on this cause. So we wanted that when people come in, if they know who we are, it's great. If they don't know who we are and then go out giving us a hug because, hey, I had a great evening and that was like amazing. And they leave not knowing at all what is how we work. That was for us. Wow, today we made it. Because it means that what the way we work can be normal. If that makes any sense. I totally understand uh, because it yeah. becomes like like ubiquitous. It's part of reality and it's not like just some performance of something. That's, Absolutely. Then yeah. you come back home and you come back to the normal life. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And do you do you feel that this zero waste concept and going really deep and normal with it also impacts your personal life and yeah, 100%, 100%, how you? 100%, yeah. Yeah. Your uh, feel of guilt goes over the top <laughs> absolutely absolutely and it's i remember at the beginning when 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 you go to the shop and it's like ah oh, fuck but before i was buying this lettuce that it comes in plastic i i cannot do it now and you start like uh, rethinking your habits so the normal starts to feel weird yes 100 percent it's 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 what I, I we were talking before you know like now the normality is it's very different than the normality that it was before yeah abso absolutely like you don't even yeah you, you start questioning your normality and and the new reality becomes normal and i think this is super cool to experience and, and to understand because yeah it shows how easy you can adapt to something that at the beginning might feel a bit this is so strange i don't know how to do it but it it kicks in very, very quick. Um, what I what I really appreciate about Nola and its concept is that it's like um, it's like a case study or laboratory for zero waste operation, actually even of a business mm -hmm. uh, that it's possible. And I think that when I hear how how Nola works. And also, for me, it's easy to imagine that it could be scalable. scalable. It's just like really, you make it work in a small scale, but then why not in a bigger scale? So it's not a concept. It's actually a deep practice of like changing an environment Absolutely. one step at a time. Uh, as an example of like something that, we, that we've been doing, it's, uh, and I think it exemplifies a little bit like who we are at NOLA. Um, we did this um, Saristolas Leipa. Saristolas Leipa is like a rye bread, a little bit sweet coming from the islands, from the archipelago of, of uh, the Western archipelago. And uh, we have, it's very common to be sold on, on Christmas. And we had, we have this company that contacted us and it said that, uh, hey, we have actually a lot of uh, edges of the breads that we don't use because when we make a bread we sold it without the edges and we were like sorry for the expression but we were like what the fuck um so they were asking how many kilos do you want because uh, we read that you are like solving waste and we were like okay what are we gonna do with it so yeah and we were like okay uh, so we I mean, it was good because all the products that they used were like organic certified. The bread is actually delicious and everything, but the edges is something that we hadn't understood. Anyway, uh, moving forward, like we got more than we should have. Uh, and we did ice creams, we did vinegars, we did everything. And the last one, we were like, okay, let's try this thing called koji that we were not very familiar with it. And we did a miso. And it was like super delicious. So 
What I mean with that is like, I think this is a great example how definitely fermentation can play like a, bi a way bigger role that is playing now in our restaurant. And it explains a little bit who we are at NOLA in a sense that we are not only trying to solve our waste in-house, but when there is waste from other businesses that it's usable, we jump to it as well. And I think this miso is like a, it's like a very clear example of like how we solve the issue with like these poor, sad bread edges that they are delicious, but people don't want them. <laughs> What about the composter? We we yeah, kind of absolutely. keep coming yeah. back to the composter. How the composter works, actually, the one you got? I mean, the, the, the main role of the composter or anaerobic digester, as I think more correctly should be called, um, it's getting uh, busy for lunch, so sorry about the sound. <laughs> you can already probably hear a bit of like a bustling. Um, but... Um, the idea of composter is like it's basically like a equipment that is trying to create the perfect conditions to create compost. So there is some heat that is passed to the mass. There is some paddles that are moving, so there is some air incorporated that is moving the mass. There is uh, some humidity that you need to keep by incorporating water, and then there is, and I guess here is where it comes the magic of fermenting. It comes these uh, microbes that they are like. Uh, degrading so you add them somehow to the the microbes they come when you get the machine they are there it's like a let's imagine like a sourdough for bread maybe it's a bit easier mm -hmm. to kind of mm -hmm. like uh, you have this mother where you take some and you add some but you never like empty it 100 percent. so it works it works the same when we empty the compost we leave there like i don't know 10 percent of the mass and then we'll keep like adding and then these microbes keep ex expanding and then we take it out and we keep adding again. Does it make a sound when it works? It makes sound because of the because of the engine that is moving the the paddles. It has this like uh, like kind of like I don't know how to say like industrial sound. But it does it from time to time. Yeah, it, it's not like all the time happening. And we turn off the composter when there is people eating next to it, so the sound is not like that. It's like maybe like five hours during the day or something. Um, I think it's important as well for me to say about the composter that uh, because you would be oh you are zero waste but you have this composter oh, that's, a, that's a beautiful like a bio waste garbage bin and we aim to use it as a resource not like not not as a not as a hiding. Uh, bin where we put all the things that oh, we don't know how to do it. Okay, we create compost, whatever, boom, it go, it's gone. We don't need to think about it anymore. So we have this software where like every night when we fill the composter, we record everything that it's going to the composter. And this software, it's kind of, it says who introduced it on the composter by being kitchen, front of the house or some other end. Um, then it, you need to pick the category of what you put on the composter. I think we have at the moment 15 categories and can be vegetables A, vegetables B, by, for different vegetables, fish, meat, cereals, etc., etc., etc. It's all broken down. And then after you choose which category, there is seven subcategories where you need to explain why you put it on the composter because it came spoiled from the farmer, because it fell on the floor, because we cook it but we didn't have the chance to serve it. Etc. Etc. And then at the end, the amount. So at the end of the month, we do readings to allocate hotspots of the operation, and and uh, and we can become better. Like, I mean, uh, because if not, it would be a bit like hypocrite to use it as a bin, saying that I'm trying to aim to zero waste. One category that is there, it's already used. And this already used category at the moment, we are reaching 90, I think it was lo not long ago, 98 point something percent of the things that goes to the compost has been used at least once. The end of this 1.2 percent, it's like, I don't know, eggshells. I still haven't found a way. Yes, it's true. You can make, grind it and put it on the plants. But what's the difference of adding in that compost if and that is a fertilizer? And our compost is actually cool because um, a farm, like most of the time, the same farmer is taking it. And because it, it, 
compost, pre-compost. And because it becomes like really spongy, he used it first as a bedding for the animals. It's a biodynamic farm. So they have like three cows that they produce manure to, to fertilize. So they use it as a bedding for the animals. And when it's saturated by whatever the animals they don't want to keep inside, just take it to the compost pile, let it like mature, and then it's used as a fertilizer. So it's actually two two lives after yeah, yeah. being already be, having already like two other lives. And what about like when I think about zero waste? Of course, we think about you no know, packaging, where the products are coming from, and I don't know equipment in the in the restaurant. But does it impact at all the ways how you work as a team? Like how you direct your energy, you know, like uh, how you are together. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think it creates this like a common cause where we all want to become better. It comes this like uh, how how we can reach to zero, how we can reach to zero, how we can reach to zero. It's almost like a mantra that kind of like uh, brings everyone together to try to become better and better on that all the time absolutely and at least from what i recall from my past life in now not normal restaurants um there is more problem solving uh, uh, skills that needed to be learned and that definitely like helps uh, or, or like brings this more like cohesive, like a team on like when something appears, how we solve it. Uh, I think it would be very foolish if someone would think that one person can solve the the, the issue related to waste. Uh, so I think the only way is like through team work and networking and like a collaborating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, definitely. So yeah, it impacts massively. Amongst our team and as well as as well with like people that you work together, farmers, fishmongers, uh, absolutely. Uh, when you plant the seed of like, hey, remember me when something maybe didn't go as planned, and you have something that you cannot per se you find use, but it still can be used and it's delicious. But for and I put a stupid example with the farmers, like when they do like thinnings. On the fields, we, we we understood that when you plant carrots, and I put carrots as an example again, you need to thin the carrots in between. So there is this like mini carrots, beautiful, delicious, that most of the times end up, and I put carrots, parsnips, whatever, end up on the compost pile. Wow, I can use them. Um, fishmonger having like excess bones because most of the customers want to have fillets. So how we solve this, and is this a pill pill that appeared in our menus, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, absolutely, like it brings wider like a spectrum of, of like a, how you collaborate, not only in house but as well outside of the house. Um, and I mean the problem solving, uh, and I hope not to be misunderstood that feel that oh it's working like that is a shit show, but more like a, there is a. I, I put a stupid example like working with the small producers. It might be a day that they are not able to bring what you expected to put on the menu today. And that's a problem that it needs to be solved. And that needs brainstorming and it needs collaboration from different parts to kind of like come with a good idea that when the customer comes at night, they have the exact same good experience as they would expect if the menu would have been the same as yesterday. As an example. Um, so I'm talking more about these problems, not like, uh, oh, what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. What are your dreams for NOLA for the next months, years? I don't believe in the work perfect. I think it's, it brings a lot of negative things to people. And it brings this like a pressure. But, but I believe you know, in the word zero, so hopefully to come to zero that's the that's the main goal from a lot of different aspects from how do i use better the water how can i solve transportation obviously how we can solve even better packaging um how we can maximize the use of ingredients every everything every single thing how in the future i would not need the composter in the dining room because we became so good that we don't need to put anything there Etc. how we can affect to people that brings us 
I don't know, wine that we don't need to have bottles that need to go to recycle, how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the future, I hope it happens from them. Like, And I think this is, this is an interesting point as well, uh, that how by a, by a small action you can affect actually massively to certain businesses. And, and the coffee is the one that we explain always that when we started, we we work we've been working from day one with the same roastery and we were asking we wanted the coffee to be brought to us without uh without vacuum bags obviously and they were like i'm not sure how we want to do that oh, that's uh, the coffee it's going to be spoiled so we found the, the the packet the right packaging for it and they started bringing it to us a year after they started using themselves and I think it was four years after, that's the normal packaging that they deliver to restaurants. So I hope NOLA can definitely help that in the future on like becoming better in-house, but the knowledge and the things we do are not only for us, are for everyone. So how we can help others or how others can use our, uh, our knowledge to become as well. What I think humbly it's better. We are using this word normal, but yeah. like as a, as a usual way of doing things. Yes. If you want to personally at home uh, start having less waste, basically, where do you start from? What's the, what's the first step? The first one, and this is something that my grandma teach me. And I bring grandma in the table as a main, uh, how you say, role of inspiration. It's like, never go to shop with empty stomach you will make the wrong decisions and i think this has been an amazing tip from a very wise woman uh, because you always buy more than you actually need and will stay and ferment not in a nice way on the back of your fridge this is for me a massive 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 tip buy in places where they offer non-single-use packaging options, farmers markets. Now, luckily, it's coming like a shops around. Uh, try to maximize the use of ingredients and be a bit creative. Like I know that being creative in kitchen when you are not a cook sometimes is a bit scary, but doesn't matter. We all learn by making, by failing. And I think this is a massive, uh, like just think this thing that normally you put into waste, how, how you can use it. And don't be scared of it. Maybe this meal is not going to be the nicest one of your life, but it still will be very nurturing. And next one will be better. Uh, we all learn. We all learn like that. And I think support companies that you feel that they are doing good. And try to learn about companies because not everyone that says that do good is doing good. I think this is this has been for me like very important lately, like how you align your belief to the companies that you support, because by supporting them, maybe not yourself are taking the action, but you are supporting people that are doing actions. So it's like a chain reaction. And uh, what else? I don't know. It's Just a like, lot of tips. I asked yeah, for yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's like uh, yeah. Enjoy and love what you do. That's, I think, the biggest one. NOLA, as well as other zero-waste restaurants, are laboratories of the future, where new habits of how we deal with food are incubated. If one can run a zero-waste restaurant, one can turn almost anything into zero-waste. And if some waste is still left, just let the microbes do the job. If you liked this episode, please share it. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again or find previous episodes, please go to fermentradio.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and more. We would love to know what you thought of this conversation, hear your human microbial stories and your suggestions for the future episodes. We are always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermentradio.com. 
You can also leave us an audio message by connecting to us on our Instagram. Ferment Radio is brought to you by Super Eclectic and is supported by Microbial Lives, Practices of New Human Microbial Cultures, a project at the center of the social study of microbes. I am very grateful for this support and most of all with all our amazing Ferment Radio listeners. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Ferment Radio.